All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the fourth of five lightning talks where the talk is lightning fast and the illumination is intense. How do you like that? The focus of several of our lightning talks in this round is about the pandemic theme. So um, you'll see what I mean in just a minute. I'm looking forward to that. My name is Martin Ramsey. I'm the managing director of the LAMP Learning Consortium and I'm going to be your moderator today. Each of our presenters will have just five minutes to do their presentation. So presenters, I'll ask you to be ready as soon as the previous presenter finishes up. Um, I'll introduce each presenter very briefly so that we don't take any time away from what you have to tell us. If you uh, want to know more about the presenters, the Open Imperio schedule has a nice biography of each one, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Also, it's always great to just connect. Um, we've got such a wonderful worldwide community of, of folks in the Imperio community. It's, it's just it's nice that we are so well connected with each, each other. And I feel like I'm seeing old friends um, now. Uh, even though I have never been to South Africa, but uh, I feel like I have lots of friends there. Um, presenters, when it is your turn, you can take the presenter privileges by clicking on your name and making yourself a presenter, or there's the big, uh, the, the blue plus button in the lower left corner of the screen that you can also grab it there. Um, if you did send me slides in advance, you can step through them at your pace, but if you want to share your screen, you can do that too. Either way is fine. My job is to keep track of time, so if you see me holding up the big alarm clock, it means you're getting close to time and you'll need to wrap up. So um, let's get started. I, I do want to point out that we uh, continue to have this international theme going on. Our present, presenters this day um, to, or this time are in South Africa and Portugal. So we're uh, th those are the two countries we're going to be focusing on first. So um, yeah, I'm seeing the chat now. <laughs> Come visit Cape Town. It's our winter and it's lovely. Okay. Yeah, we're getting in the middle of summer here. It's very soupy here. <laughs> All right, so uh, Shanali, Shan, Shanali, sorry, I promised I was going to do it right. Governor is going to uh, do the first presentation. She's going to be talking about um, the the whole idea of the pandemic and uh, time tuning during the during COVID. So, go ahead and take it away, Shanali. Thank you very much, Martin, and I hope people can hear me clearly enough. Uh, if I disappear at any point. It may be load shedding or it may be connection. Please let me know if I do disappear um, by text. Um, thank you so much for, for listening today. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the experience of time during um, COVID and during teaching online uh, in COVID. Um, so let me pop along. We all have this kind of very well-established persistent, shared imagination of what a classroom's like. And for many people, for a very long time, that's been linked very strongly to physical spaces. Um, so we know what we think of in terms of classrooms. We think of the physical structure of walls, windows, fire escapes. We think of the equipment that it needs. We think about, well, increasingly in Cape Town, whenever we do classroom in real projects, people start to think about, well, what devices might people need? How many plug points? Maybe can we turn the chairs around, etc. But we do have a really strong kind of shared imagination. And so if I flip through some pictures very quickly, all of these will feel very familiar to us, whether it's a lecture room in the United States or India or Australia or South Africa or Taiwan, a big lecture room feels very familiar. Similarly, we know what a small seminar room looks like. This picture is from um, a British university, but I could have sworn that it was University of Cape Town when I first looked at it. It was like, hmm, feels very familiar. And then perhaps on the kind of more digitally enabled end of the spectrum, people start thinking about how they can incorporate, oh, I'm so sorry, that was me being very silly and not showing people my slides very well. So let's just pop back and go the other way and say that's what I was hoping that you would see, a kind of a lecture hall, uh, what a seminar room looks like, very familiar to all of us, and kind of the digitally enabled um, end of the spectrum where you can very much see the kind of built-in screens, 
communal screens, screens for tables, even mics on tables, whiteboards, and so on. So over time, what we've done is we've made the shift from the physical to the digital. And that's the first kind of shift I want to talk about, because while in some spaces, the shift from the physical to the digital can be taken for granted, certainly in the South African context, that is not the case. So in the South African context, um, for many institutions, for many spaces in education, the shift from the physical to the digital remains aspirational, to be honest. And when it does happen, our focus tends to be very much on simply getting the technology right. So we're often very concerned with, do we have the infrastructure? Can our students just access the internet, theoretically even, um, and then can they, you know, can they afford data? Um, South Africa is a wildly expensive place when it comes to internet access and data costs. Um, and then do they have devices? And very often when we make that shift in our context from the physical to the digital, the kind of fundamental relations of a classroom, who's important, who has space, who gets heard, what are the ways of being and interacting that underpin the space? Those are not necessarily critiqued or engaged with critically. And so you will find, even when classrooms start to make the shift from the physical to the digital, that teachers, educators, are very much still at the kind of front end of the class that they are the core role for directing, managing, and pacing the learning. So the first thing that I want to sort of just say is that in the shift from the physical to the digital, by ignoring the fundamental relationships of learning, we fail to take full advantage of the affordances that digital spaces allow us. So that's the kind of first thing that I wanted to hold on to in thinking about, well, how do we manage how do we manage the complexity of teaching during the pandemic? The second thing, or the second idea that I want to add to the picture is this idea of place and space. Um, so the terms space and place are sometimes used interchangeably, and they can be used to signal more than just a location. And so I wanted to borrow into the digital the idea that a digital location uh, a site, a course site, a class, uh, 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 an online classroom, uh, an LMS, is much more than simply a location. It's not some kind of common sense external background, as Swift says, to what we do in the space. That, in fact, it is fundamentally a kind of temporary arrangement based on what we do with it and that it is always relational and multiple. So none of, neither of the two things I've talked about so far are necessarily new. We're very aware that in shifting from the physical to the digital, we need to consider the fundamental relations of teaching and learning, and we're very aware that digital and online spaces are not neutral backgrounds. And I think what the pandemic did that was perhaps particularly interesting from our perspective was that it shone the light on this third kind of space, um, on the third concept that I want to raise, which is the concept of time. And one of the things that it suggested in our context was, well, our students can learn at any time. Um, like in many, many other parts of the world, um, South African students often find themselves learning at odd times of the day and night. We have students who will say things like, I don't study during the day, my house is chaotic. I study from midnight to four o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. Then I sleep, I join the family for the day, have another little nap, and then I study. So, so there's this sense that students are studying at any time and wanting to study at any time. And so there is this sort of um, feeling that perhaps we need to meet that need to study at any time. Thanks, Martin. And so what I want to kind of close with is the idea that 
teaching at any time in the digital space requires very specific accommodations that we need to make as designers, that we need to make as educators in that space, including critically creating a common space through nurturing agreements about values and practices, through absolutely necessarily establishing and honoring our own boundaries about when we're available and when we're not. Thirdly, designing for our absence. We can't always be there, but we can kind of leave and infuse the space with elements of our presence. We can also create instructional texts, which will help our students find their way around the course when they're not there. We need to actively teach digital literacy and information literacy, so students can find their way and find things outside of our courses, which in our context is very important. And we need to critically manage pace and expectations. And finally, and this is kind of at the institutional level, we need to absolutely acknowledge the demand of teaching any time in the physical space. And then we need to create or demand from our institutions sufficient time and support to meet those needs. Okay, I'm going to stop there, I think. And hand back to Martin. Very good, thank you very much. Um, I actually took a screenshot of that last one thinking, okay, there's some good stuff to be able to pass on. I, I like the idea of it being unavoidably student driven. That was a phrase that caught my eye. All right, next we're going to stay in South Africa and we're going to go to Sam Lee Pan and Corne uh, Oh, golly, <laughs> my, my tongue got tied. Who's Tyson? Um, and there you go, you're sharing your screen already. So take it away, Sam Lee. Yeah, Corne is going to kick off. Corne? Hi. Um, hi. hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Kone, and you've already heard from Sam, and we're going to present um, how we implemented student analytics for course sites at the University of Cape Town. So the first thing is, where did we get the data from? Um, we have a student information system called PeopleSoft that stores um, demographic information, registered information about course information, courses and general student information. Um, we synchronize that with our Sakai to allow lectures to create course sites and then get the correct participants. And we also share that with um, SAP business objects to produce um, mostly demographic kind of reports for faculties and departments. Um, both of these systems have a, a scheduled extract data extraction process that runs on, uh, depending on the system, every six hours or every 24 hours. Um, and that goes into our data warehouse where we store Sakai information about students, sites, events, and sessions, um, information about our open cost lecture recording system, uh, view events, recordings, and series, and then some cohort information. Uh, that goes through a process of classifying and summarizing so that we can create a, a table that classifies weekly um, activity per student. And then we use that to actually display a course level dashboard per course. Okay. So where this started is we did a student access survey in April of 2020 to kind of figure out what students would require to go online, fully online. Um, and out of that, we realized that one of the major stumbling blocks is data and internet access. Um, that was partly solved by the university uh, purchasing data packages for students and also providing laptops and um, other devices to students directly uh, who were in need of having um, devices to access online learning. Um, and then what we started doing, oh, okay, Sam, we're good. Sure, um, the other thing that happened in South Africa was that we managed to get things zero rated for the learning management system um, and some other platforms. But what we needed to, to really know is if a student is online, um, are they actually engaged? They're actually using um, Vula, our learning management system, 
And so we kind of, to get this red, green, orange classification, um, we, looked, we looked a lot at that green category. What would we consider um, would be good access? Um, and we said that it has to be a laptop or a desktop, so not just a mobile device, because you can learn a lot from a mobile device. Some like things such as assignments and stuff would be difficult on those. Um, two or more days um, on, on the learning management system, two or more course sites, um, um, accessing a number of different content items, for example, resources or lessons, and then engaged in some type of activity um, in the chats or in the forums or um, some type of assessment. So this is, this is obviously a, a typical undergraduate course student. You'd expect them to have this type of engagement, but it didn't work so well for some of the other postgraduate um, students which might have less courses and such. But it did help us a lot um, with trying to visualize some of the activities and where students were. So if you move on, Kone. Um, so what we had is, this is a, we developed a, well, Kone and, and the, our developers uh, formed a Tsukitsu, um, which you could embed into your course site. And it takes your, so this is a MAM 1000, a first year math course of 600 students, and it would look at which categories the students would fit in for for those. Um, and you see like in the access survey, and we had like an orientation call, we weren't sure yet about how much access people would have, but that once people got started, um, they generally started um, uh, getting improving. And then you'll see some weeks when students were on um, week or, or were on block, sorry, mid, semester break then that would have gone down um, and then we did some improvements to that so this is the updated interface for this year um, and basically you could download a spreadsheet of all the communication um, sorry of all the student numbers for those different categories and then you could communicate to them um, using the learning management system creating like a like a set uh, response email for that certain group of students um, and then if we go on to the next part about what we are planning, um, so we'd like to look more at residence information and we'd like to look at where students are accessing across the world, if it will be um, Wi-Fi or LAN, um, and then different classifications for undergrad and postgraduate, and then also pre-semester, so before they start actually on the on the course, how is the access like? Um, thanks, and that's it. Okay, good, because we're we're running short on time, and I want to make sure that everybody has a chance. That's that's really helpful too. All right, let's move on to Miguel Laguinha uh, in Portugal, and he's grabbing his screen share, so that's great. All right, take it away, Miguel. Uh, actually, I'm having some trouble again because I don't see the plus button on my left. Okay, hang on a second. Let me try to. We looks like we've lost you again. Yep. Somehow you had lost moderator rights. Just a minute. I'm going to give them back to you. There we go. Do you see it now? Yeah, I do. All right. Okay, good. Thanks. Give me a minute. All right. Can you see the slides? Yep. Go for it. All right. Okay. So. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Virginia. I'm the project lead for the Open Academic Environment. And in this second talk, I'll uh, go through the process of uh, how we pick the front end stack uh, for the new front end uh, design. Uh, so, that is the premise of this presentation. Uh, OAE is re implementing the interface from scratch, which is a huge challenge, uh, mainly because we thought that uh, the technological stack was out, kind of, kind of obsolete. And the visual design was a bit outdated. Uh, so we set ourselves to rebuild it. Um, we do, however, uh, need to keep the business logic because the application is still the same. So this is what we're uh, what we've recently um, set ourselves to do. So regarding front end development, we have a ton of available, available choices. Uh, these are just some of uh, so the, the ones that are currently available, uh, all of them are open source. You might know one of them 
uh, probably React, Vue, Angular, and Angular. Those are the most well-known, I guess. Uh, but you, we do have to pick one, right? And the reason is we don't have the time and resources to learn them all. Uh, time is uh, limited, resources are limiting, and learning is hard. So we do have to pick one and, well, preferably a really good one. So when when it comes uh, to picking a good front-end framework, uh, it's really all about the criteria for your project. And this, this, uh, these are the criteria that we, that we have for OE. Um, I'll go through really briefly uh, each one. So the first thing would be that it needs to be friendly, oh, uh, web components friendly. And obviously this, um, you might find this obvious, but uh, as of today, React isn't, uh, doesn't have a perfect score with that web, web component. So basically it's not completely interoperable and compatible. Um, so that's, that would be the first thing. Um, second, it needs to be easy to pick up by junior developers, not just on our team, but also contributors from, you know, that people that come to us uh, looking to uh, to do some con contributions on GitHub. Um, obviously, having a steep learning curve, it's, uh, it drives people away. Third, uh, we're looking for a strong and friendly community. And the reason for this is pretty obvious. Uh, we'll probably run into uh, obstacles and problems that other people have already solved. So the stronger the community, the, the larger the community, the better the better because it means that we're getting uh, help uh, when we need. Uh, and then project scope, uh, basically because the more, the larger the scope, the less glue code you're gonna have. And therefore it's gonna be easier to, you know, have good code quality in general. And finally to be productive, uh, which basically means that we, we need to do more with less code. So having a few abstractions is really, really useful. So other stuff that we've looked at, uh, who owns the framework and the reputation, because you know sometimes you know the, the, there are there have been frameworks that have died pretty fast in the past. Uh, the license, obviously, uh, the current focus, because sometimes uh, JavaScript frameworks they uh, sometimes they, they change that focus uh, after a year or two, and then you get stranded. So it's not a, a good place to be in. Um, also, if possible, uh, checking out the, the current staff allocated to a project. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. So we recently tried Stencil.js, and I just recently found out that uh, Ionic, the, the company that owns Stencil, just has the one single developer maintaining it, which is kind of frightening. I mean, I, I wouldn't bet uh, on, on a framework like that if I knew that that's, there's just one developer uh, doing all the stuff. And finally, who's using it? And sometimes it's useful to know, you know, Amazon is using this framework or Apple is using that framework. It kind of gives you uh, an idea of um, how serious uh, things are. Miguel, now, I'm going to have to interrupt and say we're running really short on time. So can you wrap okay, it up? I'll go. Yeah, sure. So non criteria, obviously, vanity metrics such as get touch stars, meaningless marketing, and uh, pick up what's in your area. It doesn't really mean uh, much because we're a remote team. And uh, the, 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 one of the main things that we've done is to listen to others. And um, one of the biggest resources that we've um, found was the State of JS survey, which is an annual survey uh, that thousands of developers use. Uh, you can check the results online, like satisfaction, interest, usage, and awareness. It's a really good resource for us to um, get, uh, you know, get a sense of uh, how something is doing. So uh, finally, we, you know, we just we picked Svelte uh, because it's simple, because it's efficient, and because it has a friendly ecosystem. This is what it is working for us, but it might not be what works for you. Anyway, I hope this helps. Uh, feel free to reach us out if you want to talk further. And thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Sorry for the shortness of time here. Um, it's all right. <laughs> We uh, let me just say that the the next session is starting even as we speak here. Um, if you want to do another lightning talk, um, now that you see what it's like, we have a few slots this afternoon or the, the last session. So um, go ahead and send. And Kathy's putting the the links in the uh, chat. And really, our next session, and this is the main thing, is uh, we need to go over to the plenary session and listen to uh, Said Chowdhury from Johns Hopkins. 
as he speaks about open source program offices in higher education. So I'm going to let you all go. We'll stop the uh, recording and, and send you over there right quick. Thank you.